Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. But your first thing is that, uh, son, is there some email address? Is there an email address? Email address, not website. Is there an email address? Email address. No. Acha. Chalam. Uska patai, uska mix is not here. If I will give you an email address, if some people have questions that they don't, we don't have time or they don't feel like asking, you can email it, and then we'll have somebody print it out and put it here, and then I'll deal with the questions, pertinent questions, for those who are unable to ask in person and outside, right? If there is some address, you can write it up, and then you can send the email there, and then the print it, and I will just do it here. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The next thing is blameworthy modesty. Blameworthy modesty, which is haya is obviously something that we should have, which is modesty and shame, but there's a type of haya blameworthy in Arabic is munkat. But there's a type of haya and shame that if a person has, it actually leads to an incorrect and undesirable conclusion. And what is that? That as for blameworthy modesty, it is that which prevents one from denouncing the condemnable or from asking a question concerning a matter relating to religion and the like. For this reason, it is considered a harm for quality. As for noble modesty, such as the chosen ones, yani such as Sayyidina Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the behavior of the night he married Zainab anha when he fed his company to their full from his wedding feast, and they all left except for three. They lingered, and yet he did not request that they leave. Such modesty is a most excellent virtue. Had modesty been a person, it would have been a righteous one, and would do nothing but good in whatever it did. So modesty in our deen is known as haya. The Arabic word for this is haya, modesty or shame or shyness. Now these English words, all three of them even combined, don't really fully convey what haya is, right? Uh, haya basically means a person has a more fancy word than this in English, is comportment. That a person is well poised, is well mannered, is well controlled, has self-restraint concerns themselves with that which concerns them, right? The Prophet said in Hadith, مِنْ حُسْنِ إِسْلَامِ الْمَرْئِ تَرْكُ مَا لَا يَعْنِيهِ That from the husn, from the beauty of the Islam of a person, is leaving that which does not concern him. This is also part of Hayat. Those of you who took Islamic spirituality class would remember there were seven types of Hayat that we discussed in that class. Here, it very simply, is mentioning two things, blameworthy Hayat and commendable Hayat. Blameworthy hayah, that which prevents someone from denouncing the condemnable. This means that basically, and we've discussed this before in class, right, that in the Qur'an al-Kareem and in the Hadith, there's this command of Amr bil ma'roof wa nahyan munkar to command the good, to enjoin the good, and to forbid from the evil. Now what this means is that actually part of our hayah, uh, sometimes people feel embarrassed, I'll put this in English, embarrassed or hesitant to speak out when they see something morally wrong happening. So before we get to that, make sure you know that the conditions for being able to speak out, the Prophet said again that if you see something wrong, you should try to stop it, or you should speak out against it, or you should feel morally outraged about it in your heart. Now the conditions for being able to stop it, it doesn't mean that people should run around and start physically, violently stopping people from doing things. There are certain conditions that would enable a person to do that. Number one is that a person has, is able to do so with hikmat, with wisdom. Number two is that a person is able to do so with success. It doesn't mean to force somebody. It means really, it, in, in the most, only way you can take it as forcible is a forcible reminder. That there's somebody, let's say like a really close friend of yours, who's about to do something wrong, so you will grab him, right? This is maybe if I explain to you, uski sehi surat kya, then you will understand what is not supposed to be done. So this very close friend of yours, or a younger brother of yours, somebody who is your ma tahat, somebody whom you have some daraja of wilayat over, it can be a close student, a child, a spouse, a sibling, somebody who you have that relationship with, you will feel with them, with them that if you feel that they're about to do something wrong, you will literally grab them. Literally, you will prevent them with your hand from going into that sin or doing that sin, right? So to the extent that you have that relationship with someone, it doesn't mean that you do this on strangers, right? That verse of the Qur'an al-Kareem, لا إكراه في الدين, that, there, that well, one day it will probably come up and there's the Qur'an, but that there is no compulsion religion. Right? But one aspect of that is over here, that Nahin al-Munkar cannot be commanded by an individual. It can be by the state, by the emir or the qazi. They can legislate, and that happens all over the world. What is laws? 
Laws basically restrict permissible human activity according to the wishes of that state. So if uh, some government decrees that the speed limit is 55 miles per hour, well basically they've decided that in their view, driving at 70 miles per hour is a munkar. And they have forcibly taken mechanisms, right, and they enforce that, right, through punishments, tickets, etc., to stop somebody from going that fast. So the Islamic State, the Amir, the Qazi has the discretion if they want to circumscribe activity and to prohibit the public manifestation of haram. Actually, according to Islamic legal theory, they cannot do anything about what you do in your private home. If a person sins in their home and is not inviting other people and broadcasting that sin, then they are allowed to do so in the sense that allowed in the sense not allowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do so. But the state does not have the right to prosecute them for the violation they did in the privacy of their own home. However, me and you live in such an age, in such a place in which there is no Islamic state. So there is no public regulation of this. So that means if Islam is only given that authority to the state or the judge, and not such a state or judge exists, right? Therefore, it's not our position. We do not, it doesn't by default fall to us. It does not fall to us. Everything has its proper place. By default, it does not fall to some improper person, right? If your professor of economics does not show up, it doesn't mean the one with the 3.9 GPA will take over and teach class for that day. It doesn't fall <laughs> by default. It's over. If you don't have it, you don't have it, right? So in this day and age, you cannot do that as a vigilante or as an individual, you cannot do that. What you can do as an individual is within your own daira, with your own daira, the stopping thing, the physically, that you can do. Stop your friend, don't go there, you can tell her, don't go out, don't do that thing, right? But there's a limit even on that. You can try that, but at the end of the day, if they break free and they insist on going, then what can you do? Only when you have walayat, what's known as walayat tatama, complete authority over someone, such as a child. So a parent literally can, right, put their child in curfew or confine them to their home if they feel that the child is going out to do something which is haram against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The parent has the right to do that. Stopping it with your tongue, that is the next level. This can be done both at the individual level and the societal level. Speaking out against something verbally is not the sole domain of the state or the emir or the qazi. An individual Muslim can't do that. So that's the first thing being mentioned here then, that the first type of blameworthy modesty the first type of blameworthy embarrassment is we don't use that right, which we can call it freedom of speech if you want, to capture or hijack the terms of the others, right? But you should use that freedom of speech, right? To speak out against something that is wrong, right? Again, that is much, much more open than stopping with a hand, but that's not unlimited either. You still have to have hikmat when you do that. You should not do that in such a way that basically it's not going to be successful. <coughs> do that in such a harsh way that it will only embolden the forces of evil, it will only strengthen the people who are actually spreading uh, things that are against the deen of Islam. So somebody feels high on them. Somebody feels I'm sitting in class and I can... I'm sitting in class and somebody is saying something which is totally so obviously a misrepresentation of Islam. And they're not saying that it's my view, they're not prefacing it with anything. And a student knows that. But they're too, quote unquote, shy to raise their hand and say, sir, that's not what Islam says, right? Or that's not the only position. I mean, some type of hikmat, some words, give some other view, offer some other position, right? Uh, we challenge our teachers on all types of other things. But when it comes to the misrepresentation and misportrayal of Islam, we feel shy. That is blameworthy modesty. That's not the place to be shy. Right? At that point, a person, if they have been given the right to speak, which in most classes, most professors give you the right to raise your hand and comment on what they're saying, if you have been given that right by the instructor, as long as you can raise your hand and not be disrespectful, not be rude, but bring a possible point to their attention that you have hostas and maybe they never knew that themselves. Maybe they genuinely think that this is what Islam is and perhaps if you mention to them that there's another understanding of Islam, another aspect of Islam that perhaps they don't know, they might change their position, one should do so. If one doesn't do so just out of shyness, just out of shyness, that is blameworthy modesty, that is not the type of shyness that a person should have. Okay? Similarly, if you have a friend Okay, now they're not so close to you that you feel that you can stop them physically for doing something bad. But you know they're doing something that's going to harm their spirituality. You know you can see they're about to do something that's going to harm their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you don't say anything. 
out of shyness or out of fear that you know may bolunga to mujhe moldi kahenge ye main keh dungi wo mujhe mulani i don't know what the female equivalent for hey cuz then right so that's not no that type of shyness or khair that a fear that's coming later but that type of shyness is not a good shyness you should think that my job is to give them nasiha what i should do is think cleverly what is the best words that i can use that could somehow convince this person not to do what they're about to do right can i use words of advice words of invitation words of reminding that is what a person should do so these two i have given you two examples then of blame or the modesty the third thing was in nahyan al munkar which was what that was that you should feel it in your heart and that is also a type of shyness that literally sometimes people feel so shy that they lose their moral sensitivity internally it's not about doing anything or not about saying anything what is the example of that normally the example i give you people of that is tv and lots of people wonder that oh is it okay to watch tv or movies oh, i don't watch x rated tv or movies so it should be okay but what happens even when you watch a totally pg program when you watch a sitcom and you those of you who've heard me say this before you know my favorite example is friends friends for big thing in pakistan and you can get the whole dvd in season 1 to whatever many it was right and people watch it and they said that well there's nothing wrong in friends it's not like r rated stuff or anything like that but what happens friends eliminates your haya you should have right this ability that when a man and a woman who are not married even hug in front of you you should feel that should offend your moral sensibility you should feel that something wrong has just happened right all along you were trying not to notice but you should feel morally offended the reason mean you don't is because we've allowed ourselves to become morally desensitized by media so we see this thing so it means nothing to us so i can be standing in the line in the pdc and i can see a girl playfully slap the arm of a boy the way rachel playfully slaps the arm of joy right where did she pick it up from she picked it up from tv right so this is also something that numbs our haya it's not a good thing this is not a good thing right and so what does that mean is that when i'm standing there and my heart doesn't even feel bad about that my heart is in a sense too shy to even feel bad about that it's too embarrassing yet to make kab tak right but you have to maintain that dard in your dil you should never think that where that what's the point society has gone totally different direction the least level of nahi an al munkar is to maintain the dard in your dil when you let that dard and there's no english for this but if you keep that feeling that flame of emotional sensibility and sensitivity alive in your heart if you let that flame go down then it's very difficult right then we lose basically we lose all haya which is this one I'm moving to which is the good haya right the good haya and that's the process of some sanadith and bukhari al haya u shu'bat min al iman that haya is a branch of iman and another hadith also in bukhari said if a person doesn't have any haya fa'f al ma shi'ta that let him do tell him that let him do whatever you want if you don't have ayam man as well do whatever you want and that to put the way the world is moving towards right when they say that when they eliminate a person's eyes and they tell him that do whatever makes you happy i e do whatever you want that makes you happy there's no need for any type of restraint or any type of higher consideration or to look at what you think a divine being has to say about this don't worry about any of that so that is a completely haya free life The story being mentioned here about the Prophet and said that the Zayd bin Abi Allah Ta'ala anha is that uh, the Prophet was too modest and actually a verse came down in response to this the Prophet was too modest to tell his companions to leave and people kept staying behind and they kept hanging out with him and they kept asking him questions and they wouldn't go so he kept sitting there they wouldn't go so he kept sitting there right then Allah Ta'ala revealed an verse about this and told that you should not told basically reason the companions about a general lesson that you should not overstay your welcome you yourself should think that this person has other people who have rights over him and therefore we should withdraw ourselves after a munasib time has passed right uh, but this is his modesty this was his love uh, for the believers this is what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the quran that the prophet was haris on alaykum that he was haris he had hers he had a deep love for his sahaba and he couldn't part with them he couldn't stand to tell them to leave him because he loved it when they showed him uh, attention in the sense that they wanted to learn from him he loved seeing their talab and he was not willing or able to part with them in such a way the next thing is fantasizing the heart's engagement in matters that do not concern it is only forbidden when it pertains to the prohibited 
such as fantasizing about the beautiful qualities of a woman or dwelling on the faults of Muslims even in their absence. So what does this mean? This is referring when you talk about purification of the heart. Sometimes the heart is going to do something that you can also do by thinking or by speaking. Whatever is not permissible to do by action is also not permissible to think about in your heart. What is not permissible to do or look at is not permissible to fantasize or ponder over in your heart. So these are also sins of the heart, right? The ghibat of the heart, the hasad of the heart, the zina of the heart. So this is what is being mentioned here. That we have to purify. And that's a very deep level of purification, right? For a person to say, okay, not only fine, I'm not going to point out the flaws of this person, I won't engage in backbiting. I can control my tongue. But can I go to the next level and control my heart such my heart is not always thinking about their faults and flaws? My heart is not always basically doing some type of inner ghibah, right? Whether it's in their absence or even in this case in the heart, it can take place in their presence, right? The other thing that is being mentioned here is reflecting on those things that are prohibited, right? One should not dream, voluntarily daydream, fantasize, imagine such things. And this is again, if you don't have hayan, you open yourself up to different types of exposure, different types of media, then you will find that even if you're able to stay away from certain sins, bil fail or bil amal, but you will find thoughts of these sins plaguing us. And those thoughts are not permissible and they actually soil our heart. And you imagine that that heart, it, which is constantly thinking about such things, can the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come into that heart? Can the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come in that heart? Can the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come in that heart? Can taqwa come into that heart? It's not possible. It's not possible. So actually our heart is the most precious organ that we have, our spiritual heart. And therefore we have to preserve it, we have to construct a fortress of sabr, of taqwa, of ibadah, of amal, of salih around it, so that no impure thoughts even come to it. That person who succeeds in doing that, if we can make our heart such that we don't have any impure thoughts, then you will find that that heart will automatically, when we make sure that we leave our heart free from negative influences, then our heart automatically on its own will incline itself towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So the untended pure heart leads itself towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you don't have a pure heart, then you must tend to it. You must watch over it. You must keep vigil over it. You must protect it. You must cleanse it. You must purify it. And if you do that, then that will go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously here again, this fantasizing is about things that are prohibited. Doing, thinking about something that is permissible and obviously even doing the highest form of tafakkur, which is reflecting upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His essence, His attributes, His relationship with us, that is obviously a good thing. This time for fantasizing, and that's why in English actually this is a very good word, fantasize. We don't normally use that word for good things. Normally we use the word fantasize for things that are impermissible, that we can't do, we wish we could do them, and therefore we fantasize about them, right? We dream about them. So one shouldn't do that. This is also part of the that Allah ta'ala, I am shameful. My shame for you isn't just that I won't do that action. My shame for you is that I won't think or fantasize about that action in my heart which is your home. Because the Prophet said in the day that قلب مؤمن عرش الله That the heart of a believer is the arsh, the real arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's his real seat. This is where his gaze falls. Allah says in the Quran that he does not gaze at your faces or at your appearances or at your wealth. But rather he gazes at your breast and at your a'mal. Right, which means your heart, he gazes at your inner self. So when we know from the Quran that the gaze of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala falls here, why in the world would we want to let all types of impure fantasies and impure desires develop in our heart where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's gaze falls? The next thing is fear of poverty. Fear of poverty, and I might change this a bit for us, but fear of poverty originates in having a bad opinion of Allah. A bad opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and its cure is having a good opinion of Allah. In other words, su is zan and husn is zan. Su is zan and husn is zan. Having a bad opinion of Allah is su is zan. And having a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is husn is zan. And knowing that what Allah possesses is never diminished in the least and that what has been apportioned to you will reach you inevitably. One who uses his religion 
as a means of benefiting his worldly condition is a sycophant, is a hypocrite in his transaction. And he ultimately shall be the one defrauded. What does this mean? Right? Fear of poverty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran al-Kareem that shaitan threatens you with poverty. Shaitan puts the fear of being poor in you and by the, through the means of which he guides you to immorality. But rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you maghfirah. Allah has promised you forgiveness and risk and bounty. What does this mean? That if a person starts to fear poverty or that they will be less well off, right, then they will perhaps engage in some sin. Right, you will find that when you are in tough times, then you do things. But they say in, you say in Pakistani English, by hook or by crook. Right? Why is that? What pushed you to that? Because maybe there is this fear. And if I don't do it by crook, I won't be able to get something. I might, if I don't do some sneaky way to get this car, to make this deal, or to push this business venture through. If I don't do that, then pata nikya hoga. Maybe I'll get nothing. Maybe I'll be zero. If I don't lie in my resume, maybe I won't get the job. If I don't lie, then maybe I won't get it, right? If I don't lie in the interview, maybe I won't get the job. So a person gets this fear. So in this case, right, in extreme cases, fear of poverty, fear of failure, fear of not succeeding in a worldly sense, fear of lack of worldly success or worldly achievement or worldly accomplishment can make a person do things that are sinful. Now why is he linking this to su'izam? Because we are forgetting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the giver of everything. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the being that bestows everything upon us, and we think that we won't get it unless we lie, then we're actually saying that Allah ta'ala is not going to be able to give me this job unless I lie in my resume. Astaghfirullah, how can we think such a thing? Or when you say it, it sounds ludicrous. But actually that's what the action is saying. And that means we have a hus- we have a su is done, we have a bad opinion of Allah. But rather than by reciting also this verse in the Quran, the Kareem, a person should have a good opinion that no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give me. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be even more likely to give me even more risk if I stick within the sharia, if I make myself such that I'm pleasing to Him. And knowing that what Allah possesses is never diminished in the least, and that what has been apportioned to you will reach you inevitably. Right? Whatever I'm going to get, right? And this is the only time you're supposed to look at destiny. Right? As something that can save you, reflecting on your destiny as being inevitable is not to make you leave ibadat, but it's meant to make you stay away from sin. Right? That whatever is going to happen is going to happen anyway. My committing this act of sin or lying or backbiting or anything isn't going to make anything any better. So why not let my tikdir arrive to me in a state that I'm honest, rather than make myself a liar and embrace that tikdir through lying and falsehood. Then lastly, he says that one who uses his religion as a means of benefiting his worldly condition is a sycophantic hypocrite in his transaction and he ultimately shall be the one defrauded. Now we should be careful, right? This should not be something that we just use and we uh, slander other people. You know, one thing you will find uh, that some people slander and defame certain religious people who work in this field of Islamic banking and say that they just do that because they like to get some salary from the bank and they're trying to make money off of it and they're just using their religion for a worldly gain. So you should be very careful before you slander somebody like that. What's being mentioned is using religion for a worldly gain is is niyat. And this is not really being mentioned as being whatever they're paid as an expert or a shri advisor or a board member. This means that, number one, you try to use your religiosity to convince people to give loans to you or to give donations to you personally, not for some institute or for some foundation or for something beneficial, but at a personal level, right? Uh, that is very wrong, right? And that sometimes that person also does so out of fear of poverty. What motivated them? It wasn't something bad. They weren't trying to be a fraud, but they had this illness in them and they were afraid. And so rather Allah Ta'ala is saying, you should have tawakkul in me, you should trust Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala that He is the giver of risk. So there's no need to fear. And do not let this fear make you do things or you think that you should not be doing. Next thing is ostentation. This will be the last one because we're going to actually spend a bit of time on this. Ostentation in Arabic as well as proper Urdu is called riya. Riya, to do something for show, for display, to show off. Its root cause is covetousness. So its root cause is hirs. And doing good works for the, of, for the sake of showing off. 
the cure for covetousness is also the cure for ostentation. All right, the cure for hirs is also going to be the cure for riya. So roll up your sleeves if you want to set out and cure what is at the root of all these diseases and what exacerbates them, what excites them, what makes them even more pronounced. I mean that showing off is one of the calamities of the heart, the definition of which is to perform an act of devotion. So the first type of riya is to perform an act of devotion for other than Allah Ta'ala's sake. To do ibadah or dua or to sit somewhere, to do anything for other than the sake of Allah. Rather, it is for the purpose of seeking some worldly benefit or praise from His creation. Or per- to protect oneself from the opposite, that is loss of wealth or dispraise. The worst form of riya is that which results in a sinful deed, such as a pretentious display of virtue, so as to be entrusted with the wealth of an orphan. The next degree is what is done for some worldly manner, using good deeds as a means to obtain it. Finally, showing off is that which is done out of fear of the scornful gaze of people. It is cured by knowing that if all of creation were to join forces to oppose you or support you, they would not be able to do so except by his permission. Indeed, he alone possesses rewards for your actions in both abodes, and he is all-powerful, the ever-righteous, the thankful. Before we go to the cure, what exactly is riya? So several types of riya are being mentioned. Number one, in ibadah, in ibadah, riya means to do ibadah for any reason other than for the sake of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is riya. In other actions, riya means to do something specifically for the reason of trying to increase your honor and status in the eyes of people, that you want people to do vava, to people to praise you, right? Like somebody says to you a story, Jab me dafa haj par gaya tha, to ye ye hua. اب بس کہتا تھے جب میں ایک دفعہ حج پر گیا تھا اب یہ بتانے کی ضرورت نہیں تھی کہ میں دس بھی دس اب یہ is trying to show people that I've gone to Hajj ten times right so and and sometimes you will find that this is I mean that person even who said that didn't really he might say I didn't really mean میں تو ویسے I was just you know but you have to watch yourself also Rayan all of these things are very subtle they're very hidden they're very embedded they're not always their ugliness is not always naked and stark in front of you so you have to keep a vigil and a watch. Okay, do I have riyah? First cut, you might think, I'm told, no, I'm riyah free. Oh, look deeper. Look deeper and deeper. And you will find everything that has been mentioned so far and that will be mentioned there. It's just a question of how deeply you want to look for it. Like many times you give the example of MRI, right? When a person is sick, the doctor cannot just look at him. And his external self may not actually show the inner cancer. So the doctor has to go through an x-ray, a CT scan, and an MRI. So just like that, you have to do an MRI of your kalb. Look deep inside. Muhasabas, what is called an hasabu kabla anta hasabu. Look deeply inside yourself before your breast is exposed for everyone on the Day of Judgment. That's what Allah Ta'ala keeps saying over and over again. In the Quran that I know ma sudur, I know what you hide, I know your sir, I know your khafi, I know your akfa, I know everything that you do. Your secret self, your inner self, your innermost self, your secret most self. So it means, why is Allah Ta'ala telling us that? Why is He emphasizing that? Because there must be things in our hidden self that we do, that we need to fix, that we need to cure. And that's what these things are. So sometimes our reality is a bit hidden. Another way of showing off is that we sit down out of the fear of the scornful gaze of people. That again, this, no, this fear of makhluk, either desire that we want makhluk to praise them, too much love for makhluk, or too much fear of makhluk makes us do actions outwardly or apparently just for the sake that they be observed and noticed. Right? You should be very careful of doing that as well. Sometimes people wonder that, okay, but, but let's say I want to do something to make somebody happy, right? Like my parents. And if I don't share with them this accomplishment or achievement, then there's no way they would be able to be happy with it. So yes, in those cases, in those particular relationships that you have, that there's the special relationships in which the deen itself is commented on the fazila or the virtue or merit of such a relationship, which is such as parent, child, sibling, teacher, student, if sometimes within reason, within limits, you feel a sense of achievement or accomplishment that you want to share with the other person, right? To make them happy, that is fine. But the action that you did should not be for their sake. So let's say your mom has been after you, uh, to be a person of Fajr. And in Ramadan, as long as you've been managing to pray Fajr, so one day you tell your mom on the phone just to make her pleased and happy that, oh, you know, I've actually made Fajr every day in Ramadan. 
that's okay because you're presenting the achievement and accomplishment to her. But the moment you did the action, when you get up for Fajr, the niyat of the action cannot be, I'm doing this so I can tell my mom on the phone that I pray Fajr. So that's the difference between riya and actually wanting to please someone, is that during the act itself, you have to do it for the right reason, for the right intention. But once you maybe get some success or achievement, you want to share that with someone, or maybe because they put time into you, your parents have put money into it, you want to share with them your good grades, your teachers put time into you, you want to share with them your accomplishments and the deen, for that reason. But that's not the reason you do those things. It's only the reason you share that achievement, and that is not done with the riya. Right? Perhaps in fact a person can do it that I want To even increase myself Maybe one way I can increase myself Is if I tell this person They will put more effort on me They will make more dua for me Because they'll see that I'm a sincere student I'm actually progressing Right. So that is not real. Okay. The cure So the first cure that he mentioned is Number one to know this Curing this notion of makhluk That makhluk can do nothing for you if all of Makhluk gets together and praises you, it's not really going to benefit you spiritually. And if all of Makhluk gets together and views you as a fundamentalist or says something bad about you, right, or doesn't like your beard, it's not going to harm you in any way, right? So the Makhluk are not able to help you or harm you. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone who has the ability to reward us and to be pleased with us. And as if we look at, okay, I don't want X, I want X to be pleased with me or I don't want Y to be displeased with me. So we should really want is Allah to be pleased with me. If you really want to say whose pleasure should you really be after? It should be Allah's pleasure. And whose displeasure should really make you scared? Really make you terrified? It's Allah's displeasure. What if I do something that displeases Him? So when we realize that the overarching thing is Allah's pleasure and Allah's displeasure, then that itself, just reminding ourselves of that, would keep us from doing things for the sake of the pleasure or displeasure of creation. Second cure, it is also cured by being always conscious of its harm, which results in detesting it and thus warning it off. That is its theoretical treatment. What does this mean? That if you know after going through this that riyah is something that is bad, riyah that is an inner sin, riyah is an ailment of the heart. So just knowing that it is something that is bad might be enough for you theoretically to ward yourself from it and to keep yourself from it. Veiling, this is the theory. Now, practical treatment. Number one, veiling is one's actions from the eyes of others. So if there's something that you did normally used to do for Riyadh to stop, don't stop the action. There's another confusion people have. Some people say, oh, you know, I'm worried that maybe I'm doing this for Riyadh. Maybe I'm teaching Quran and my niyat is it in Riyadh. So I should stop teaching. You shouldn't stop the action. You should stop the bad intention. The action was good. The intention was bad. So what needs fixing? What needs fixing is the intention, not the action. Oh, you know, I think maybe the reason I'm praying is because my roommate told me to. Maybe that's what reminded you to pray. But if you feel that way, don't stop the action, don't stop the prayer. Change intention. You can change it. You have the power to change that. If you are worried that I'm praying because my friends tell me to, then you can now yourself choose to be a person who prays because I want to. So change the intention. Don't give up the good action. This is a big trick of shaitan. He will make you remember Riyadh this way. That you will never remember that Riyadh is a sin. But the day this will work on you, Riyadh will come to you as the biggest sin. That, oh, they call you are just doing it because so-and-so told you. Otherwise, you would have never done it. And so many delils will come to you. You would have never done it. You would have never thought of it. You're only doing it because of this. So then, basically, your action becomes so belittled in your eyes and you leave that action. This is a trap of shaitan. He's trying to get us to leave a good action. So don't leave the good action, but rather change your bad intention. The practical cure then is to veil one's actions from the eyes of others. So if you feel that, okay, I was reading Quran, and somebody was saying that I wanted him to hear how beautifully I recited, so stop, recite silently, or go and read Quran somewhere else. Veil your actions because maybe we're not strong enough to perform our actions in front of others because we notice when we do that, real creeps in. So then perform your actions in isolation. Frequent recitation of Kullu Wallahu Ahad Because this is mentioned in the Qur'an al-Kareem Allah SWT has chosen to label this as Surat al-Ikhlas As you would think this should have been called Surat al-Tawheed Right? Kullu Wallahu Ahad Right? And all of it, the whole surah, I mean the whole surah you all know it by heart Is about Tawheed But no, Allah SWT has chosen to describe it as Surat al-Ikhlas And the word Ikhlas doesn't come anywhere in there Right? Any derived form from it Right? The notion here is that Tawheed in of itself is a means to bring you to Ikhlas. And so what we need here is what we call Tawheed Matlab in Arabic. Tawheed Matlab, Tawheed Fidniya. That you should be singular in your purpose, singular intention that everything we do is for the sake of Allah. 
And, so, and that is what is the meaning of ikhlas, that you, we are sincere. And the other way, the third practical treatment is istighfar, that a person should seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, Ya Allah, it was your majesty that made me do this. I should have done it only and only for your sake. As for the chronically diseased heart that results from showing off one's good works, it too will find a cure in this and what a cure. As for a type of hypocrisy that involves concealing one's wrong actions, this is in fact an obligation. So somebody says that, well, I'm a hypocrite, I should let everybody know all my sins. No, you're actually supposed to conceal your sins. You're not meant to go and expose yourself. You're supposed to expose and acknowledge your sins to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ikrar, the confession is done to Allah. It's done to only human being if you need his, her, her, her help to get you out of his sin. But just completely confessing all your sins is to be done directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to other people. And as far as other people go, we should actually confess. Or we should actually conceal our sins. It's not other to openly, unabashedly tell people of the sins that you do or the sins that you did. And telling them that random people is not any form of expiation in our deen. Confessing all of that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repenting is something. Telling somebody to understand why is it that I do this sin, how can you get me out of this sin, that is also fun. But just randomly telling people is not a good thing. As for what relates to the permissible, adorning oneself with it falls between recommended and prohibited. Okay, Those things that are permissible, a person can show those things that are permissible. So you show the netmas, the bounties, the blessings Allah has given you. right? For the seeker of knowledge or someone desiring to show the blessings of wealth, it is recommended. Okay, It is recommended for somebody who wishes to share the blessings or show the blessings out of humility. That won't be called riya. Right? So if Allah Ta'ala has given you some wealth, and we did this before when we did love for the world, and due to that you choose that, okay, let me make myself some clothes that make me well presentable and well kept, and therefore I give the sunnah a good noble presentation. That is okay, that's not riya. In other words, however, you are doing an action for the sake of makhluk. That's what I'm trying to explain here. Doing an action for the sake of makhluk can be permissible. An example of that is this, right? That I'm going to do something to make myself look more presentable or make myself more whatever, right? For the sake of others, I'm doing it purely for the sake of others. I'm looking in the mirror and combing my hair for the sake of others. I can't see my hair, right? That is okay. That is permissible and sometimes it can be recommended. Including in this is somebody visiting a fellow Muslim for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? That obviously is doing something for the sake of makhluk. That is recommended. Not just permissible, that is recommended or any other well-intended deed for that matter, unless you desire haughtiness or boastful competition. So if you go and visit that person for your, to, out of haughtiness, out of arrogance, uh, to boast about it later, that, oh, I went and I saw these three people today, or I did this. So you should be very careful. One should not boast. One should hide these things. It's not considered proper other than our deen to boast. Uh, the example of this is giving zakat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Qur'an al that you should give zakat secretly and openly. The asal is to give it secretly. That is the tertib. The only reason you should give it openly is if you feel that by doing so, by giving it openly, perhaps somebody might receive a dawah or might feel that, okay, if this person can do it, so can I. If this person can get up and do something for a few days of his life, then maybe I can too, right? So for that it's possible, but you have to watch your heart. If in your heart you feel that there's some boastful element there, then you have to view yourself that I'm a sick person. It's unfortunate if I was healthy and I could be free of riyah, I could do this openly to benefit other people, but unfortunately I'm sick. And therefore I have to work on myself because I cannot benefit others to the harm of myself. So if I allow myself to do things that let myself fall into riyah, I have to stop it. I have to cure myself. Once I'm cured, then I can go back and try to do that in a productive way. Scholars are of two opinions about seeking some benefit in this life through worship as opposed to seeking only the hereafter or even seeking the hereafter to, or, to, or uh, seeking the hereafter or seeking its delights is it sincerity or is it showing off right famous example of this that came up in the classical Muslim period is in the beginning the person who was the imam in the masjid this was not a paid position this was whoever was in the community people would go and amongst them who was the most senior most would normally lead and within any small community, it was pretty much well understood and well agreed upon who was the most 
pious, learned, etc. person, and after him who was the second and who was the third. As the Muslim Ummah spread, number one, and as unfortunately distance from Allah spread, and you had less perhaps people, right, who were learned, less people who were practicing, then the very first time this issue came up, the can you set a stipend, that's how they viewed it. It's also the way you face it. Can you set up a stipend for somebody to teach hadith, or to teach Quran, or to become imam in the masjid? And if you do, then what is that person doing? I mean, how is that person... Because the people themselves also said that, look, we don't want to take a stipend, because then I'll feel like I'm coming and I'm doing Jummah as a job. <laughs> I'm getting a salary to lead Jummah, or I'm getting a salary to lead the prayer, and that will be awkward for me, and then how can I say I'm praying only for the sake of Allah as an imam or as a follower, right? When now I'm getting a salary. So the question is that if you get monetary compensation for something, did that negate your niyyah to be actually be doing that religious act or that worship for the sake of Allah. So the scholars came to the bishop and that no, right? That the, the purpose of the stipend is just intizam. It's just to make intizam because we need somebody who is regularly there and we need to make sure somebody who is qualified and knowledgeable enough to lead the prayers regularly present. Otherwise people will show up and it will be difficult for them. So for the sake of intizam, we are make, going to make a stipend muqarrar. But that person's own sawab is based on their own niyat. So we will not say because the imam is praying. He prayed before. When he was an imam, he prays on his day off. He prays when he's traveling. He prays otherwise. So therefore we are going to construe that his niyat and his prayer is based on what's in his heart. And his heart is he's doing that worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore these two things are not mutually contradictory. Then he mentions the thing that I mentioned to you. Right? Uh, Some also consider that merely, one more thing, some also consider that merely taking delight in people's awareness of one's actions is showing off. The Imam Malik did not consider that harmful as long as the original intention was based on the foundation of sincerity. So the notion here is sometimes a person's intention changes. They start something with the intention to just do that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. While they're doing it, right, this extra identity comes upon them that now they are a doer of that deed. So before they began Kirat for the sake of Allah, Duran Kirat, they realized that now I'm a Qari. Right? All of a sudden this identity or position was put upon them. So if they enjoy having that identity, the question is that does the enjoyment of that identity nullify and negate their original intention? So here is mentioning Imam Malik Allah's position that it doesn't nullify the original intention and the Asul Niyah will be based on the beginning. And if his Asul Niyah was one of Ikhlas, then if some secondary thing comes to him, that will not affect it. But others are of the position that no, you have to maintain that ikhlas, and you have to maintain that purity 100%, and it's better, it's better not to let any such peripheral feeling or peripheral enjoyment come into a person. Next thing is in fact, deeds that are done while showing off are better. This is what I mentioned. Deeds, actions, a'malu salih, that are done with riyah, are better than abandoning those amal entirely due to the fear of riyah. So it's better to do a naqis amal than to lose the amal entirely. It's better to do an action that has a defect in it. And one reason for that is actually if you give up the action, it's a cop out, it's the easy way out. What's harder is to try to fix the defect. So you actually haven't cured yourself, you just stopped the action. That's not a cure for riyah. Cure means that you will only be cured when you can do the action and not feel the ostentation. That is when you will be cured. So in order to do that, you must keep doing the action. And you must keep doing it and keep working on the riyah. Right? And then one day, inshallah, that will be fixed. Similarly, the scholars have preferred the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the tongue with a ghafil kalb over a ghafil kalb and heart combined. So somebody says, what's the point of me reciting istighfar a hundred times a day? I do it in ghaflat. I don't do it thinkingly, I don't do it penitently, so that's why I don't do it. So we say, no, even if you can do it, at least your tongue is zakir, if you can't get your heart to be zakir, then work on that. That is the next goal. Try to make your heart present. And you will find this most, I mean, he's using it for dhikr, but you will find this in this day and age that people uh, say this a lot about salah, about prayer. That the reason I don't pray is because I don't feel anything. I can pray with my tongue, but I can't feel anything in my heart, therefore I've chosen to abandon the prayer. So this is what we're saying, no, do not abandon the act because it is defective. Improve the act. Achieving perfection in the act is never going to happen at the outset. Very few things in life you do perfectly the first time around. Do you abandon it? 
Did you abandon studying because you didn't get an A and the second you got an A minus you should drop out of lungs? You could say, <laughs> I cannot be perfect, so you should tell your parents, therefore I will drop. So just like you do not drop lums just because you cannot always get a 4.0, you do not drop your prayer just because you cannot get a 4.0 in your prayer. You have to keep praying. Huh? That's a separate minute is you should try to improve the quality of your prayer like you try to improve the quality of your ilm or the quality of your studies. Imam Ghazali Rahimullah has mentioned that there are three types of people in term, respect of their ibadah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first are those who f- worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala freely. Freely, it means actually in Arabic these are called the ahrar. They are hur. Ahrar is pure the hur, which means to be free, which means they are liberated from any false need. This is a good freedom. In other words, they worship Him freely, free from all of our concerns and constraints. They worship Him purely and purely for His sake, for His pleasure, out of His love. These are known as the ahrar. The second are those who worship, and Imam Muhammad said they worship like merchants. They worship like merchants, they worship because they want to get something. That's a level, that's a darja, it's permissible. And for that darja, fazail, kibbat chalti. I tell them that they will get so many rewards for this prayer. They will never pray a shock for the sake of Allah, but you tell them they get reward for one umrah, they're ready. Right? So he's, Imam Ghazali is saying that it's not impermissible, but it's not the highest level they worship Allah Ta'ala like merchants, looking for the sawab. And three, they're people who worship Allah like slaves. And they're the people who are not worshipping Allah purely for His sake or out of His love or out of His remembrance. Nor are they worshipping Him for the sawab. And this third level is also permissible. And if you, even if you bring yourself to the third level, it's a big thing. They worship Allah like slaves who do so, and He's using slaves out of the fear of the whip. In other words, out of the fear of hellfire. Out of the fear of punishment, they worship Allah. This is a minimal level. You could only discard, let me make this clear, you could only discard the minimal level for a higher level. You cannot discard the minimal level because it's a lower level. You can only give up the C for a B. You cannot give up the C mutlaqan. If anybody feels that, yeah, that's me, I only worship because I'm afraid, I only worship because I think if I don't pray, who knows what will happen to me. And yes, that's not ideal. But you cannot give up that prayer. You have to work towards a better reason. Work towards the level of seeking the ajr. Work towards the level of seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa So this is true for any single thing that we do in our deen. If we're doing anything at the minimal level, and we start chastising ourselves that look, it's so low quality. Fine. Good that you notice that it's low quality. Good that you chastise yourself. But do not abandon it, except that you can abandon it successfully with something of a better quality. That's what we do. If you don't have, you have whatever, maybe not such refined food to eat, you won't give it up for famine. You won't die of hunger. You'll eat it. <laughs> the only way you will ever give it up is if you have something better to eat. So just like that, you don't want to give yourself up to spiritual famine. That look, the quality of my amal are not good. I don't have istikamat, I'm not regular, I'm not good, I don't feel anything, etc., etc. Fine. Keep working on yourself. But do not abandon what little you had, what meager portions you had. If you do that, then you will fall into spiritual famine. You might not feel that hunger. Like you feel, unfortunately, we are more tuned into our stomachs than we are tuned into our kalb. Therefore, you will never let. There's none of you who have that strength, that himma to voluntarily starve to death. None of you have it. I don't have it. No way. You would give in and you'd start eating. No matter what it is, I'd give you scraps, I'd give you dog food, you'd eat it. Maybe not after a day, but came in with her die. You'd eat it that. Right? We just look at ourselves like that. We should feel the famine of our hearts. Our hearts are thirsty. Our hearts are starved for ibadah. Even if we're able to feed them our few scraps of our nakis ibadah, which are done without concentration, without love, at least that's keeping our heart alive. If you close that, if you don't give those heart, your spiritual heart, even those scraps of ibadah, then your heart will die. And if you let your heart die, it's very difficult to revive it from the death. It's a miracle. You all heard yourself say, bringing the dead back to life, that's what you call a miracle. That's the ultimate miracle. Right? So don't try to be, put yourself in a situation where you need to become a miracle worker. That we become so distant from Allah SWT, we allowed ourselves to die. Then Allah, it's going to take a miracle to bring you out. And 99% that only can be Allah SWT Himself. Out of His mercy, His economy chooses to blast you with hidayah again. It happens. Sometimes we see men like that. 
That literally they put themselves to the brink and Allah Ta'ala yanks them back. Then they put themselves to the brink again and Allah Ta'ala yanks them back. Allah Ta'ala, how long will this go on? They should think to themselves that how long do we, do we want to test that limit? One day maybe we'll be able to fall off. There will be nothing. Bakr Sahib. There will be nothing to bring us back. Why do we always push the limits? Right? So better to remain safe. Better to remain in a haven. Better to flee inward. Run more and more towards the amal of the deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to become people who reach better and better levels of worship. Better and better levels of adab and akhlaq. May He accept us in this month of Ramadan to purify our heart. To keep us from all the ailments of the heart. From ostentation, from riya, from fear of poverty, from fantasizing. May He grant us the noble modesty, the good haya. And may he keep us from falling into the deception of the false modesty, the blameworthy modesty. Wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Any questions on any of the things you can ask? Them. Yes, yes. If you choose not to do what? Something sinful. sinful. Yes, the intention was wrong, but the action is still good. It doesn't mean that, Jalo, I'm only not doing the sin because of them, that's wrong, so I should go ahead and do the sin in front of them. That doesn't defeat your riyah at all. (laughs) That doesn't defeat the riyah in any way. So you, you should not do that sin. The cure for this is not to do that sin, but if you're not doing that sin because of that person, that's wrong. That's wrong. Not only is it a type of riyah, you could even call this a type of shirk. Right, the person that we worship is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The person that we fear is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The being, the star person, the being that we worship, the being that we fear is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should do things for His sake, and we should abstain from things for His sake. Sometimes, what what you should do on that, you can make a du'a that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I feel shame in front of this person, not because they're human, but because of the taluk that they have with you. That's why I'm feeling embarrassed in front of them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since you've allowed me to come this far, that I'm embarrassed in front of a person who has thought look with you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let me feel embarrassed in front of you directly, and let me have my own thought look with you such that I feel embarrassed in front of you. Alright, come on. Blameworthy modesty. Yeah. Hmm. Take it, there's several ways to look at this. Number one is that if it's something you're genuinely unsure about, so in that case maybe you might want to be silent. But if there's something that's crystal clear, you know without a doubt from our deen that that is something that is not correct. Right? There's no doubt in your mind about that. Uh, and there's no difference of opinion on that issue. Right? In that case, then let's move to your example, but you think that there are other ways that this person might be better than you or more knowledgeable than you. So then you, the, the, you can be correct to sense that perhaps directly speaking to them might not help. But you should still try to find some way to subtly or anonymously or through some ishara bring that to their attention if possible in a way that may not, w- would not look that you're trying to disparage the other good things that there are about them. And per- perhaps you could even use that and tell that person that you know you're so much better than me in so many ways uh, and it's not that I'm in any way trying to disparage you, however, X, Y, Z. So you can mention that. Uh, but yes, I mean, the hikmat is that you have to speak to a person to the extent that you think that you will be able to successfully communicate to that person, right? Um, without hurting them or offending them or pushing them in the other direction. Because sometimes people become too overzealous in this, and by actually trying to enjoy the good, they actually end up pushing a person completely the other direction. Or by forbidding the evil, they push the person the other direction. So you have to be careful for that as well. But as long as your niyat is sound and you make du'a to Allah before you do it, 
inshallah then the barakah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mother the Nusrat would save any such bad result or consequence from happening And that's the highest level. You should have all three. Each level subsumes the lower one. So maybe you can rephrase the first level. They pray for the fear of the whip alone. Second is that they pray for the sawab alone. Right? Third level is they pray for all three. There might be some people are of the position that the fourth level is higher, which is to pray for the sake of Allah alone. Possible. Possible that you do something only and only for the sake of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the love for Allah could be even the ultimate highest one. Right? But most of us will combine that that's something, maybe I'll explain to you this way. That ultimate state, that is not something you can acquire. That is something that is bestowed upon somebody by Allah. We are in the job of acquiring those states that the Quran and Sunnah tell us to acquire. And in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many things about fear. He himself is making us afraid, is making us fearful of punishment and of the hell. So we want to acquire that fear that he wants us to have. That's part of our ubudiyah. Secondly, he is also enticing us with reward and glad tidings. So he wants us to be enticed. So it is our ubudiyah, our servanthood, that we should be so enticed. And thirdly, he also mentions in the Quran his love and doing things for his sake and that class. So we should also have that. So in terms of acquisition, you should try to acquire all three. After that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself may make that last one a ghalib on you to such an extent that as far as you're concerned, the predominant reason you do think is out of his love. But that's, he will do that to you. Your job is to get all three because all three are there and all three are part of our deen. Uh, there are different positions on this. The most strict position on this is that of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. Because he takes the deeds of the Prophet that that person who deliberately leaves the Salah becomes an unbeliever. So he would process that person as a murtad. He will say that that person has become an apostate. Now, according to him, then that person should be called in and he should be counseled. Right? And it's up to the Amir and Qazi how long they want that counseling to take place. Which is that person should be, they should try to bring them back to Islam. Imam Amr's position is though, if after a certain time period, I mean, whatever, so much time expires in which you think, uh, or whatever the Amir or Qazi or whoever is doing the counseling thinks that this person is just stubborn and will never recant their apostasy, uh, he is of the position that that person should be killed. But that is a minority position in Islam. The majority of Sunni Jewish did not feel that this was a reason to kill someone because they don't take that hadith literally. And they say that what the Prophet meant when he said that is that that person who leaves Salah deliberately does not become an unbeliever but has committed an act of unbelief, has committed an act of kufr but has not exited Iman because Iman is still something that's in their heart. Uh, and that is something perhaps me and you in this day and age can appreciate more because we see many people around us who genuinely sincerely do say that they do believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but they don't pray and it's very difficult to view that person as an apostate rather one would view that person perhaps more accurately as a sinning believer and it's not permissible to kill a sinning believer all right that he's not an apostate that he doesn't be killed yeah okay Allah's the last part. If you're doing good deeds externally and we 
at times you don't feel what? Good about it. Like at times, for example, if a girl feels bad, embarrassed about her job, or, you know, no. Oh, take it, take it. Okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Right. 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 That's, no. Hippo- okay, that's a particular state that a person has, that they sometimes do ibadat unfeelingly. It's hypocrisy only if a person is content with staying at that state. If a person, not only, you can keep praying that way, you might remain on that state, that's not hypocrisy. But if your heart is content with remaining on that state, that you say, well, take it, no problem. Uh, yes, that's okay. That's okay, and that's not just okay, that's very commendable. That a person, and first of all, it's obligatory that you maintain all five prayers. Secondly, it is commendable that those two in which a person is not feeling something, that they should strive and try to do anything and everything in which they can feel it, and that they should also make dua to al They should never be content. They should never give up, right? As long as they're trying, they may be able to try more some days, maybe too busy and try less other days, but as long as at the very least it's their talab, it's their heart's desire that they want to make all five out of five feeling prayers, that their heart never becomes content with three out of five, then they don't fall into nifak. All right, so we'll stop here because of us. So I'll just make two announcements. One is related to your question. On Saturday at 3 o'clock, we're actually going to do a workshop exactly on this, which is called Perfecting Your Prayer. Since, alhamdulillah, Ramadan is a month of worship, uh, and I think for everybody, our quantity of ibadah has gone up. So why not use the barak of this month to try to increase the quality of our ibadah? And that will specifically give very, very specific methods to try to improve the quality of our prayer. And the second thing is that tomorrow at 4.45, we will be having our dars at tafsir There was some confusion about that, that perhaps it was canceled. Tomorrow we will be having our dars at tafsir at 4.45, Friday, tomorrow, 4.45, in A15, A14. The email? Uh, if any of the girls have questions that they didn't feel like asking, uh, they can email uh, Sanatarak and she'll print it out and give it to me and I'll answer it next time we come.